As Stan slowly regained consciousness, he felt a sensation of being dragged along the ground. Gradually, the darkness lifted from his mind and he opened his eyes. He found himself lying on his back, staring up at the stars, shining through the thin, hazy clouds of smoke. A towering heap of railroad ties loomed beside him, casting a long shadow in the moonlight. He struggled to assess his situation. His hands were bound in front of him, but not so tightly that he couldn't wriggle free. His legs were unbound, and he felt a sharp pain in his head and left shoulder. As he surveyed his surroundings, he spotted the silhouette of a man in the distance. Stan was on high alert, but he soon realized the man in front of him was not paying attention to him. Instead, he was listening and watching for his comrades. Stan strained his ears, but he could hear no voices or shots. Suddenly, he thought he heard footsteps on the gravel in the distance. He was unsure of what to do. If there was only one guard over him, escape seemed easy, unless the guard had a gun. Hey, you! Stan called out. The man jerked up in surprise. Hey, yourself! He replied. What's your name? Stan asked, trying to be friendly. Well, it ain't J.J. Hill or Smith, the man replied gruffly. Stan chuckled. But you wish it was, don't you? He joked. My name's Stan. What's yours? Dennis, the man replied gloomily. Ah, I see. That's the name of all IWWs, Stan said knowingly. Say, are you the guy who had the shotgun? I sure am, Dennis replied. I ought to knock you on the head. Why's that? Stan asked. Because I'll have to eat standing up for a month, Dennis grumbled. Stan raised an eyebrow. Yes? The seat of my pants must have made a good target, because you sure pasted it full of birdshot, Dennis explained. Stan tried to hold back a laugh, but his anger soon took over. Didn't you burn my wheat? he demanded. Are you that young Arquette? Dennis asked in surprise. Yes, I am, Stan replied hotly. Well, I didn't burn one damn straw of your old wheat, Dennis insisted. You didn't? But you're with these men? You're an IWW, you've been fighting these farmers here, Stan accused. If you want to know, I'm a tramp, Dennis said bitterly. Years ago, I was a prosperous oil producer in Ohio. I had a fine oil field. Along comes a big fellow, tries to buy me out, and when that failed, he shot off dynamite charges into the ground next to my oil field. Choked my wells. Ruined me. I came west, went to farming. Along comes a corporation, steals my water for irrigation, and my land went back to desert. So I quit working and trying to be honest. It doesn't pay. The wealthy are only getting richer at the expense of the poor. It's why I'm now a drifter, the man lamented. Friend, that's a tough break, sympathized Stan. It really makes you think, but I'll tell you one thing, you don't belong with the IWW, even if you are a drifter. Why not? asked the man. Because you're American, that's why, Stan replied. Well, I know I am, but can't I be American and travel with a labor union? No, the IWW isn't a labor union, it never was. Their main goal is to abolish capital, they're anarchists, and now they're backed by German money. The IWW is an enemy to America. All this sabotaging of railroads, destruction of timber and wheat, it only helps Germany in the war. The United States is at war. Can't you see that your own country will suffer because of these actions? The hell you say, exclaimed the man in disbelief. This stone guy is probably a German agent or spy. He's not a labor leader. What does he care about people like us? Young man, if you don't shut up, you'll make me want to go back to real work. I hope I do. Here's some advice. Leave the IWW and go to Triton. Ask for Smith at Many Waters Ranch and tell him I sent you. Smith at Many Waters, huh? Well, maybe it'll surprise you to know that Stone is there. He's got a lot of men and is heading there from here. No, that doesn't surprise me. I hope he does go there, because if he does, he'll get killed. Shh, whispered the guard. Here comes some of the gang. Stan heard hushed voices and quiet footsteps. Some figures emerged from the darkness. Bradford, has he come to? asked Stone's cruel voice. Nope, replied the guard. I think he got a hard hit. He ain't moved an inch, said Stone. We gotta get out of here, he continued. It's way past midnight and there's a freight train down the track waiting for us. Everybody needs to get on it. You, Bradford, go catch up with the others. What are you going to do with this young guy? asked Bradford, curious. That ain't none of your business, replied Stone. I know it ain't, but I'm asking anyway. You want me to join your IWW, but I need to know if you're going to let this Arquette go. Striking for your rights is one thing, but burning wheat or hurting young farmers is another. Stone's group of five men stood in silence. 
Bradford towering over the smaller stone. Stan watched, intrigued. I'll cut his throat, hissed Stone. Bradford lunged forward, striking Stone in the face. Stone would have fallen hard, but his comrades caught him. They held him up, but he was clearly unconscious. Bradford backed away, then turned and ran. Stone's comrades held him up, peering at him, but no one spoke. Stan saw his opportunity. With one swift move, he freed his hands. He reached for his gun, but it was gone. Without hesitation, Stan rushed towards the group. He saw Stone's pale face in the starlight and knew that he was recovering. With all his might, Stan swung at Stone, hitting him harder than Bradford did. Stone was lifted off his feet and fell onto one of his men, knocking them both down. As Stan fought off his attackers with swift punches to the right and left, he managed to knock them down and make his escape into the darkness. He could hear their piercing yells behind him, which only fueled his adrenaline. However, he soon found himself confronted by another group of men whom he guessed to be members of the IWW. They were gathered around a fire, and they spotted him just as quickly as he spotted them. Realizing that he had no choice, Stan turned to run back the way he had come, only to face the men he had just assaulted. They immediately opened fire on him, and the sound of bullets whistling past him was uncomfortably close. With all his might, he ran as fast as he could. When he finally reached the end of the line of cars, he found himself under the light of a new fire. He could hear someone yelling beyond a nearby shed, and he thought he recognized Jerry's voice. But he didn't stop to find out. As he ran across the freight yard, he could hear the sound of his pursuer's heavy boots and their hoarse cries behind him. He intended to circle around the station and make his way to the village, but he knew he had to put some distance between himself and his pursuers first. Looking back, he could see the gang, well spread out, coming into the light of the new fire, but he was sure that no one in the group could ever catch him. Suddenly, a powerful blast of wind seemed to lift him off his feet. At the same time, a blinding yellow light illuminated the whole area, and the earth seemed to shake beneath him. A deafening roar filled his ears as he was thrown through the air, surrounded by streaks and bursts of fire. He landed in the dirt, tumbling and rolling until the force of the explosion had been expended. Lying on the ground, Stan gasped for air and coughed up dust and debris. He was almost blinded by the chaos around him, the rain of gravel and the rank smell of gasoline but he was still sensitive to the terrified cries of men and the taste of smoke in his mouth. He knew he had to get up and escape before his pursuers caught up with him. Slowly, Stan got to his feet and groped his way through the murky darkness. He could hear men running and yelling off to his left, and the rumble of a train coming from below the village. Finally, he emerged from the smoke and found himself in a field opposite the station. He took a moment to rest and assess his condition surprised to find that he was only bruised, scratched, and sore. He had expected to be riddled with bullets. Whew! They blew up the gasoline shed, he exclaimed to himself. But some of them miscalculated, for if I don't lose my guess, there was a bunch of IWW closer to that gasoline than I was. Some adventure. I got another punch at stone. I felt it in my bones that I'd get a crack at him. Oh, for another. And that Bradford, he did make me think. How he slugged stone. Good, good. There's your old American spirit coming out. Stan sat down to rest and listen. The only sound he heard was the rumbling of a train gradually drawing away. A heavy smoke rose from the freight yard, but there were no longer any flames or patches of red fire. The explosion had smothered them all. It had been a rather intense evening, but he took satisfaction in knowing that he had punished some of the IWW members, even if he hadn't killed any of them. When he thought of Stone, however, he didn't feel any satisfaction at all. The anger that had consumed him had dissipated, replaced by a resolute decision that those responsible for the destruction he had witnessed should be held accountable. He had no desire to come face to face with Stone again, as he knew it would result in violence. Of all the events of the evening, Stan found his chance encounter with Bradford to be the most fascinating. It gave him a new perspective. How many of the members of the disorganized and chaotic IWW had suffered injustices similar to Bradford's? He suspected there were many such stories. Stan tried to recall instances in the wheat country of the Northwest where laborers and farmers had been taken advantage of by those in positions of power. It disheartened him to realize he could recall many such cases. Even his own father had a long-standing grudge against Smith and his father's friend Newman was known for his shady dealings. It seemed that many had profited from the misfortune of others. 
Nevertheless, Stan understood that not all members of the IWW were corrupt or immoral. He was grateful for this revelation. The IWW was founded by labor activists, and they were the ones who should be held responsible for their actions. Their punishment should be severe. Stan began to see how the war, as brutal as it would be, could ultimately benefit the country. As dawn approached, Stan was surprised to realize how much time had passed. He waited a little longer, wary of encountering any remaining members of the IWW. It seemed they had all fled. As he made his way across the freight yard, he saw the devastating aftermath of the fire. The elevators were destroyed and his bountiful wheat yield along with them. It was hard for him to comprehend the extent of the damage. A number of freight cars lay in ruins on the tracks. When Stan finally reached the street, he saw a group of men gathered in front of the cottages. They called out to him, and he met them halfway. Jerry and Olson were at the party. We were pretty scared, said Jerry, his face showing his anxiety. Man, we thought the IDW had taken you, added Olson, shaking Stan's hand. Nah, where are they? questioned Stan. Gone on a freight train. When Jerry blew up the gasoline shed, it fixed the IDW, explained Olson. Did you do that, Jerry? asked Stan. I reckon, replied Jerry. Well, you almost blew me off the map. I was running just below the shed. When that explosion happened, I was lifted and thrown a mile. I thought I'd never stop. As far as we can tell, nobody was killed, said Olson. Some of our guys have bullet wounds, but no one's seriously hurt. That's good. I guess we got lucky, said Stan. You must have had quite a fight chasing after the IWWs like that. We heard you shooting and the IWWs yelling. That part was fun. Tell us what happened. So Stan narrated his experiences from the time he stole off with the big shotgun until his friends saw him again. It was a long story, but the villagers were all ears. Arquette, you and Jerry saved this village from being burned, said one of the men. We all did our part. I'm just glad they're gone. What damage was done? asked Stan. It turned out that there was little damage to the villagers' property. Some freight cars filled with barley, loaded and billed by the railroad people, had been burned. This loss of grain would probably be paid for by the company. The loss of wheat would fall upon Stan. In the rush of the harvest and transportation to the village, no provision had been made for loss. The railroad company had not accepted his wheat for transportation and was not liable. Olson, according to our agreement, I owe you fifteen thousand dollars, said Stan. Yeah, but forget it, replied Olson. You're the loser here, Stan was told by the farmer. I'll pay it, replied Stan. But man, you're ruined, exclaimed the farmer. You can't pay that big price now, and we don't expect it. Didn't you leave your burning fields to come help us save ours? queried Stan. Sure, but there wasn't much of mine to burn, the farmer replied. And so did many of the other men who came to help. I tell you, Olson, that means a great deal to me. I'll pay my debt or— But how can you? interrupted Olson reasonably. Sometime when you raise another crop like this year, then you could pay. The farm will bring that much more than I owe Smith, Stan replied. You'll give up the farm? exclaimed Olson. Yes, I'll square myself. Arquette, we won't take that money, said the farmer deliberately. You'll have to take it. I'll send you a check soon, perhaps tomorrow, Stan insisted. Give up your land, repeated Olson. Why, that's unheard of. Land in your family for so many years. What will you do? Olson, I waited for the draft just on account of my father. If it had not been for him, I would have enlisted. Anyway, I'm going to war. That silenced the little group of grimy-faced men. Jerry, get our horses and we'll ride home, said Stan. The tall foreman strode off. Stan sensed something poignant in the feelings of the men, especially Olson. This matter of the IWW dealing had brought Stan and his neighbors closer together. And he thought it a good opportunity for a few words about the United States and the war in Germany. So he launched forth into an eloquent expression of some of his convictions. He was still talking when Jerry returned with the horses. At length he broke off rather abruptly, and saying goodbye, he mounted. Hold on, Stan! called Olson and left the group to lay a hand on the horse and to speak low. What you said struck me deep. It applies pretty hard to us of the bend. As farmers, we never really thought much about our country. We left our homeland to come here, so we never really had a strong connection to it. 
Personally, I'm not German, and I've never been to Germany. However, many of my neighbors and friends are of German descent. The war never really seemed to affect us until now. I know Germans who live in this country. They left their homeland and have become citizens of this country. They have no allegiance to Germany now. It may take some time to get them to understand the gravity of the situation, but I am confident that they will come around. The German Americans of the Northwest will be true to the country they have adopted when the time comes. You can take my word for it, Arquette. Chapter 16 The sun blazed over the wheat fields as Stan and Jerry pulled up to the farm. Stan couldn't believe how barren and dismal everything looked. However, the fallow land extending to the south still held its beauty, and it seemed to smile at him, urging him to wait for another spring. But he couldn't wait. He had to leave for many waters soon. As he washed the blood and grime from his body, he realized just how many bruises he had. His head had a lump and his hands were scraped. After changing his clothes and packing his papers and a few belongings in a valise, he headed down to breakfast. Though he was lost in thought, he could tell that both Jerry and the old housekeeper were surprised and worried to see him preparing to depart. He hadn't said anything about his plans, and he knew that this was going to be difficult. As the time came to say goodbye, his tongue felt thick and his voice sounded strange. Martha, Jerry, I'm leaving for good, he muttered hoarsely. I'm going to give the farm to Mr. Smith. I'm leaving you in charge here, and I recommend that you stay on. Here's your payment up to date, said Stan to Jerry. I'm going off to fight in the war, and I don't think I'll ever return. The old housekeeper, who had been like a mother to Stan for many years, began to cry. Jerry was filled with regret but couldn't find the words to express it. Stan abruptly left the house, leaving Jerry and the housekeeper behind. It was strange that he was feeling such difficult emotions that he had never considered before. But the truth was that he was leaving his home forever. Stan first went to visit the graves of his father and mother on the south slope. The simple burying ground had not been affected by the fire. Although there was no grass, a few trees and bushes kept it from appearing barren. Stan sat down in the shade near his mother's grave and looked out across the hills with a distant gaze. A subtle assurance came over him that his mother approved of his decision to go to war. He remembered her as a slow, quiet, patient, hard-working woman who had been dominated by his father. The slope was hot and still, with only the rustling of leaves in the wind. The air was dry, and Stan missed the sweet fragrance of wheat. The odor that lingered was like burning weeds. The bend opened up on three sides, undulating and vast. His parents had spent the best of their lives there and had now been taken to the soil they loved so much. It seemed natural. Many were buried there, toilers of the wheat who had spent their last days on those hills. Surely in the long frontier days and in ages before, countless men had gone back to the earth from which they had sprung. The dwelling places of men were beautiful. It was only life that was sad. In this moment of reflection, Stan couldn't help but feel overwhelmed with human emotions of longing and regret. He drew strength from the two graves on the windy slope, but the meaning of life was something that couldn't be fully comprehended by anyone. As he walked across the fallow land and stubble fields, memories flooded back from his boyhood days. He remembered crushing down the stubble with his bare feet, and every step brought forth a new recollection. When he entered the barn and climbed the airy loft, the smell of straw and years of dust and mice filled his senses. The swallows darted in and out, their friendly chirping filling the space. Home was important even for birds, and the swallows had returned year after year to their nests. The old barn had seen better days, and Stan decided that it needed to be strengthened. The rough shingling had holes and boards were missing from the sides. The accumulation of grain dust on the rafters and in the corners was as thick as snow, and mice ran in and out almost as tame as the swallows. As he bid farewell to the mice, he remembered how he used to chase and trap them with his boyish ingenuity. But that instinct, along with so many other things, had faded away. The horses were what he loved most, especially the faithful old badge who had carried him when he was a boy. He and a neighbor boy had once ridden old badge when they went to fetch the cows from the pasture. Stan mounted his broad back from the fence, feeling the thrill of the ride. The mischievous neighbor boy had struck old Badge with a stick, and the horse had taken off at a gallop towards home, with Stan holding on tightly and bouncing up and down on his back. It was a ride unlike any other, but when he returned home, his father had whipped him for the adventure. 
It was only after giving up these ordinary experiences on the farm that Stan realized their true value and meaning. The hills, barn, horses, swallows, mice, cows, and chickens all had a role in shaping him into the person he was. As he slowly made his way back to the old house, Stan climbed the stairs to the three rooms upstairs. One of the rooms, his mother's, had not been opened in a long time. It was just as he remembered it, and it stung him to think of her and how he was now a man going out to fight for his country. The question of why he was doing it lingered in his mind, but he couldn't find an answer in his mother's room. With a last look, goodbye, and a word of prayer on his lips, he turned to his own small room. The room was tiny, with a sloping roof that forced him to stoop when close to the wall. There was no ceiling, just bare yellow rafters and dark old shingles with little holes that let in light. The window was small, low, and without glass. It was in this room that he had sat many times, leaning out in the hot summer nights, dreaming of a future that never came true. Unfortunately, the hopes and dreams of one's youth often fall short. This room, which had been a constant presence throughout his life, was a significant part of him. He confided in it as if it were a living being. Although he had not achieved what he had hoped for, he didn't feel ashamed at that moment. He realized how few possessions he had, but he had learned to make do with what he had. His time in that room was over, and he was filled with immense sadness. Despite this, he would not have wanted anything to be different. He was being called to pursue greater, selfless things. He was bidding farewell to his youth and all that it represented. Memories of nights spent in that room with the wind howling and the rain tapping on the roof flooded his mind. These were precious memories that no amount of pain, sorrow, or war could ever take away. As he prepared to leave, a wave of tears overwhelmed him. This room was dearer to him than any other part of his home. It was difficult to leave, and his last look felt magnified and transformed. Goodbye, he whispered, his throat tight with emotion. He paused at the top of the dark old staircase and bowed his head. Then he slowly made his way down. Chapter 17 As the sun began to set on many waters, Marcia Smith found herself lost in thought, staring out her window at the peaceful fields that had just been harvested. Lately she had been feeling a sense of tension and longing. After much internal struggle she had finally admitted to herself that she was in love with Stan Arquette. Since then, her love for him had only grown stronger with each passing thought and every flutter of her heart. Despite the ache of longing and a nameless dread that she couldn't ignore, Marcia felt content. She had a woman's intuition that a crisis was imminent and waited for it patiently. Suddenly she heard her father's heavy footsteps and boisterous voice downstairs. He was so busy with the harvest that he hardly had any time for his family. Marcia had been lost in her own dreams and hadn't spent much time with him in the fields lately. She was waiting for the right moment, and her father's sharp eyes always made her feel uneasy. She had never kept any secrets from him before. "'Where's Marcia?' she heard her father ask downstairs. "'Lenore's daydreaming,' giggled Kathleen. "'Well, where is she daydreaming?' Smith inquired. "'In her room,' the child replied. "'And you can't get a word out of her with a crowbar.' Smith laughed heartily as he ate his supper. Then Marcia heard her mother Rose and Kathleen excitedly talking about a letter that Jim had sent from his soldier training camp. Rose read the letter aloud to her father, and everyone listened intently. Marcia's heart skipped a beat as she caught a few phrases from Jim's letter. It meant the world to her. He had gained weight, was getting stronger, and was feeling great. He was confident that he could beat any boy in his outfit to a stuffed bag of a German soldier. He was also skilled with a bayonet and could make quick work of it. Jim's message was a source of pride for Marcia, and she didn't regret sending him away. She knew deep down that she would never see him again. Smith let out a loud roar of delight upon reading the letter, slamming his fist on the table. The girls joined in on the excitement, but their mother remained noticeably silent. Marcia, lost in her own thoughts, paid them no mind. When her father called for her, she responded promptly. As he made his way up the stairs, Marcia couldn't help but feel uneasy. Her father rarely visited her room, and when he did, it was usually because he needed her help with something. He entered the room, asking if he could turn on the light. Marcia agreed, although not entirely willingly. Instead of turning on the light, Smith stumbled around the darkened room until he found Marcia curled up in her window seat. He sat down heavily in her armchair and asked how she was doing. 
Marcia knew that he had come with news or trouble, as he always did. She prepared herself for what was to come. Smith began by mentioning the great letter he had received from a boy. Marcia caught a glimpse of his unguarded face as he lit a cigar with a match. She knew that she needed to be strong. The letter had filled Smith with pride and a fighting spirit. Smith let out a heavy sigh, causing the end of his cigar to glow and fade. Did Jim's letter give you any kind of feeling? he asked his daughter, Marcia. I'm not sure what you mean, Marcia replied. Did you sense anything strange or different? Smith asked, struggling to find the words to express himself. For me, Jim's letter said something he never meant and didn't know. Jim will never come back. I had a feeling like that too, Dad, Marcia whispered. It's strange, Smith mused, taking a pull on his cigar. The two fell into a contemplative silence, united by the understanding of Jim's fate. They drew strength from their unwavering courage and the divine spark that drove Jim forward. Marcia gazed out into the darkening shadows, feeling the cool air on her face and the weight of the world's fate bearing down on her. I've been staying home like you asked, Dad, she said, breaking the silence. But I've noticed the smoke clouds over many waters lately, Smith nodded. Something's coming, he said gravely, and we need to be ready. Is that smoke from a forest fire? Marcia asked. Some of the timber is on fire, but the wind isn't blowing the smoke in this direction, replied Smith. Then where is it coming from? Marcia inquired. Some of the wheat fields in Bend have been burned, Smith answered. Burned? You mean the wheat? Marcia exclaimed. Yep, Smith confirmed. Oh no, which part of Bend? Marcia asked. I think it's the desert of wheat that young Arquette owns, Smith said. Oh, that's terrible. Have you heard anything else? Marcia asked. Just rumors so far, but I'm afraid it's the worst and I feel sorry for our young friend, Smith replied. Marcia felt a sharp pain in her chest, leaving behind an ache. It will ruin him, she whispered. Nah, it won't be that bad, Smith reassured her. It'll only be tough on him and a bit embarrassing for me and you. That boy's proud. I bet he gave the IWWs a piece of his mind if he got to them, Smith chuckled with delight. Marcia felt her anger rising. She was her father's daughter, but she had always been slow to anger. Her mother's softness and gentleness had tempered her father's hard spirit. But now her blood ran hot, beating and bursting around her throat and temples. Her body quivered and her fists clenched tightly. Dastards, those foreign IWW devils should be shot, Marcia cried passionately. They ruined those poor heroic farmers. They ruined that boy. It's a crime. And to burn his beautiful field of wheat with all his hopes. What shall I call that? Well, lass, I think it would take stronger language than what you know, Smith replied. And I'm using that same language. Marcia sat there trembling, with hot tears running down her cheeks and her fists clenched so tightly that her nails cut into her palms. Marcia was filled with rage as she realized her powerlessness to prevent the looming catastrophe. The bitter and dark trials weighed heavily on her, and she couldn't help but feel acute pain at the thought of the despair that Stan Arquette must be feeling. Marcia, Smith began slowly, his tone gaining strength and vibrating with emotion. You love this young Arquette. This statement caused a tumultuous shock to course through Marcia's body. She quivered with a shuddering thrill, knowing that her father had spoken the forbidden secret she had whispered to herself in private. Marcia gasped as her anger dissipated in an instant. Even in the darkness she buried her face, trying to comprehend the conflicting emotions and thoughts that now plagued her. He had not asked, he had affirmed. He knew, and she could not deceive him even if she wanted to. For a moment she was weak, caught in the midst of contending tides. Sure, I saw he was in love with you, Smith continued. I saw that right away, and I wouldn't have thought much of him if he hadn't been. But I wasn't sure of you until the day Arquette saved you from Thompson and brought you back. Then I saw, and I've been waiting for you to tell me. There's nothing to tell, Marcia faltered. I reckon there is, he replied, leaning over and tossing his cigar out the window. He took hold of her, and Marcia felt his impelling presence like never before. She was powerless against the warmth and strength of his hand, feeling safe and secure like she had when she was a little girl. She crept into his arms, burying her face on his shoulder, and felt as though her heart would burst if she didn't release the emotions that had been building up inside her. Marcia whispered with a soft voice that trembled, Oh, Dad, I love him. I really do love him. It's terrible. 
I knew it the last time you took me to his home when he said he was going to war, and now you know. Smith held her tightly against his chest, lifting her with a great heave. Uh-huh. I guess that's a relief. I wasn't so sure, said Smith. Has he told you he loves you? What do you mean? asked Marcia. Has Arquette confessed his love to you? Marcia lifted her face. If her confession had brought relief to her father, it had brought even more to her. What had seemed terrible before now felt natural. However, she was still intense, vibrating, and internally convulsed. Yes, he has, she replied shyly. But it was such a confession. He told me as if he was explaining his own boldness. He fell in love with me at first sight, and meeting me was too much for him. He wanted me to know. He was going away to war and asked for nothing. He seemed to apologize for daring to love me. He asked for nothing, and he has absolutely no idea that I care for him. Well, I'll be darned, exclaimed Smith. What's wrong with him? Dad, he's proud, replied Marcia dreamily. He's had a hard struggle out there in his wheat desert. They've always been poor. He thinks there's a vast distance between an heiress of many waters and a farmer boy. But more than anything, I think the war has fixed a morbid trouble in his mind. It must be real enough. A house divided against itself is what he called his home. His father is German, and he is American. He worshipped his mother, who was a native of the United States. He has become estranged from his father. I'm not sure, but I feel like he's obsessed with his German heritage, and that's why he's so eager to go to war, Marcia said to her father. Well, Stan Arquette ain't going to war, her father replied confidently. I took care of that. Marcia was thrilled and jumped into her father's arms. Daddy, what did you do? I got him exempted, Smith said proudly. Exempted? Marcia asked, confused. Don't you remember the government official from Washington? You met him in Spokane. He was out west to encourage farmers to grow more wheat. There are many young farmers who are needed a thousand times more on the wheat fields than on the battlefields. And Stan Arquette is one of them. That boy will be the biggest wheat grower in the Northwest. I recommended exemption for him, and he's exempted, but he doesn't know it. He doesn't know? Marcia exclaimed. He'll never accept exemption, Smith said, worried. I'm afraid there's something strange about him. But he's sensible. He can be told things, and he'll see how much more he's needed to raise wheat than to kill Germans. But father, what if he wants to kill Germans? Marcia asked earnestly. She felt something strange about Arquette that she couldn't explain. Then it's up to you, my girl, her father said grimly. I have no sentiment about Arquette in this matter. One good wheat grower is worth a dozen soldiers. To win the war and feed our country after the war, it'll take millions of bushels of wheat. I've sent my own son to fight, but he's never been one to raise wheat. All he's ever raised is hell, and his kind is needed now, so let him go to war. But Arquette must be kept home. That's up to Marcia Smith, said Smith with a laugh. I'll use my woman's wiles when Arquette comes. The Northwest can't afford to lose young men like him. If he's lost his wheat, he'll come down here to make me take the land in payment of the debt. I'll accept it, and then he'll say he's going to war. But we'll have it out. I'll offer him such a chance here and in the bend that he'd have to be crazy to refuse. But if he's got a twisted mind and thinks he has to go out and kill Germans, then you'll have to change him. But, Dad, how can I do that? asked Marcia, torn between hope, joy, and fear. You're a woman now, and women are in this war up to their eyes. You'll be doing more to keep him home than if you let him go. He's crazy about you. You can make him stay. And it's your future, your happiness. Child, no Smith ever loves twice. I cannot throw myself into his arms, whispered Marcia. I didn't mean for you to, replied Smith gruffly. Then if he doesn't ask me to marry him, how can I— Marcia, no man on earth could resist you if you just let yourself be sweet as sweet as you are sometimes. Arquette could never leave you. I'm not so sure of that, Daddy, murmured Marcia. Then take my word for it, he said as he got up from the chair, still holding her. Your happiness is more important to me than anything else in this world. You love that boy. He loves you. And I never met a finer lad. He need not be a slacker to stay home. He can do more good here, Marcia's father said, sitting in his armchair. Besides being a wheat man for his army and his country, he can be one for me. I'm getting old, my dear. I have the biggest ranch in Washington to look after, and I want Stan Arquette to look after it. Marcia hugged her father. Dear old daddy, you're the most wonderful father any girl could have. 
I'll do my best to obey, even if I don't love Stan Arquette. To hear you speak so sweetly of him, it chokes me. Now, good night. She kissed him and gently pushed him out of the room. As she lay on her bed, her face buried in the pillow, her hands clutching the coverlet, she surrendered to a breaking storm of emotions. Terrible indeed had come the presaged crisis of her life. She loved her wild brother Jim, who had gone to atone forever for the errors of his youth. She loved her father, who had finally confessed the sad fear that haunted him. She loved Arquette, the stalwart, clear-eyed lad who set his face so bravely toward a hopeless, tragic fate. These were the burdens of the flood of her passion, and they rushed her from girlhood into womanhood, calling to her with imperious desires and deathless loyalty. Chapter 18 As soon as Marcia's outburst of emotions had died down and she lay peacefully in the darkness, she noticed the sound of hasty footsteps passing by the path beneath her window. Initially she paid no attention to them, but gradually the consistent steps became more distinct in number and frequency, arousing her curiosity to the point where she decided to get up and take a glance outside. "'I'm not a child any more. I can take care of myself,' retorted Marcia. "'And I deserve to know what's going on. I heard men passing by my window, and I want to know who they are and what they want.' Jake hesitated for a moment before finally relenting. All right, Miss Marcia, he said. But you stay behind me and keep quiet. We don't want to give ourselves away. Marcia followed Jake down the path into the grove. As they crept closer to the clearing, she could hear the low murmur of voices. Peering through the bushes, they saw a group of men gathered around a fire. Marcia recognized some of them as her father's neighbors and farmhands, but there were a few unfamiliar faces as well. They were all dressed in work clothes, but some of them had bandanas tied around their faces. Marcia watched as her father stepped forward and addressed the group. Gentlemen, he said, his voice low but firm, we all know why we're here. The IWW has been causing trouble in these parts, and we can't just sit back and let them run roughshod over us. We need to take action, and that's why I've called this meeting. We're going to form a vigilante group to protect our homes and our families. Who's with me? There was a murmur of assent from the group. Marcia felt a cold knot form in her stomach. She had heard stories of vigilante justice before, and they never ended well. But her father seemed determined, and she knew there was no talking him out of it. As the meeting broke up and the men started to disperse, Marcia and Jake slipped away unnoticed. As they made their way back to the house, Jake turned to Marcia. You shouldn't have come, Miss Marcia, he said. It's dangerous. I had to know, replied Marcia and I can't just sit back and do nothing. I want to help. Jake looked at her for a moment, then nodded. All right, he said, but you have to be careful. This is serious business. Marcia nodded, her mind already racing with plans and ideas. She knew she couldn't stop her father, but maybe she could help him do it right. Maybe she could make a difference. I'm going to go find out where those guys went, said Marcia confidently as she stepped down onto the path. Jake, however, had other ideas. He leaned his rifle against a post and grabbed her with force, swinging her back onto the porch. The light from inside the house illuminated his face, which had turned pale from the effort. "'Why did you have to handle me like that, Jake?' Marcia asked, feigning reproach. She was trying to coax the truth out of him. "'You hurt me!' "'I'm sorry if I was rough,' Jake apologized. "'I'm just a little upset, and I mean business.' Marcia closed the door and then returned to Jake's side, whispering in the shadows. I was just joking. I would never disobey you. But you can trust me. I won't tell anyone, and I'll worry less if I know what's going on. Jake, is my father in danger? I reckon he is, but we've got him covered. There are four of us cowboys guarding him during the day, and at night he's surrounded by even more guards. He's not likely to get hurt, so don't worry about that, Jake assured her. Who were those men I heard passing by? Where are they from? Marcia asked curiously. They're farmers, ranchers, and cowboys from all over this side of the river, Jake replied. There must have been a lot of them, Marcia observed. You haven't heard the half of it. There are way more people attending Smith's meeting than you could ever imagine, Jake said. Why? Marcia pressed. Tell me, Jake. Jake hesitated, his hand slapping against the rifle stock. We've been ordered not to say anything, he finally replied. Come on, Jake, you can tell me. You always tell me secrets. I won't tell anyone, Marcia pleaded. Jake stepped closer to her, his head almost level with hers as she stood on the porch. 
Marcia could see the determination in his eyes. Well, it's like this, he whispered hoarsely. Your dad's got a group of vigilantes together, like in the old days. They'll be the ones to take care of this IWW gang, said Jake, his words sending chills down Marcia's spine. She had heard many tales from her father about the legendary vigilante band who enforced the law where there was none. I should have seen that coming from my dad, she whispered. Well, that's how things are done out here, and your father is the man to do it. There won't be much wheat burned in this valley, you can bet on that. I'm glad I can't stand the thought of it. Jake, have you heard about Mr. Arquette's misfortune? asked Marcia. No, I haven't heard about him, but I knew the bend was on fire and I figured Arquette would lose his wheat. He had the only wheat worth saving up there. These IWWs and their German bosses have outdone the old days of rustling cattle, robbing stagecoaches, and just plain causing trouble, replied Jake. I wish I could have lived in the old days, mused Marcia. Me too, even though I'm no spring chicken, chuckled Jake. You should head inside now, Miss Marcia. Don't worry or lose any sleep over this. Marcia said goodnight to Jake and went to the sitting room where her mother sat with a sad and thoughtful expression. Rose was busy writing a long letter to Jim while Kathleen pretended to read while secretly munching on a snack. My goodness, Lenore, you look ridiculous. Why don't you laugh? exclaimed Kathleen. I'm not in the mood. You're as pale as a ghost. Your eyes are huge and purple. You look like a starving cannibal. If this is what it's like to be in love, count me out. I'll never fall for a man, replied Marcia. You should be in bed. Mother, I suggest the youngest member of the family be sent upstairs, said Mrs. Smith. Yes, dear, it's way past your bedtime, added Mrs. Smith. Aw, oh, no, moaned Kathleen. Hey, Marcia, he said, wiping his forehead with a handkerchief. You seen Arquette yet? No, not yet, replied Marcia, trying to keep her voice steady. Well, I reckon he'll be here soon. Best be ready for him, said Smith, heading towards the door. Marcia nodded, watching him leave before returning to her knitting. She tried to focus on the stitches, but her mind kept wandering to Stan. She wondered what he would say when he saw her, if he would still feel the same way about her. The thought made her heart race. Hours passed, and Marcia began to worry that Stan might not come. She had been waiting all day, and the sun was starting to set. Just as she was about to give up hope, she heard a knock at the door. Marcia's heart leapt into her throat. She rushed to answer it, her hands shaking. When she opened the door, there he was, Stan Arquette, looking just as handsome as she remembered. Marcia felt her cheeks flush. Hey, Marcia, he said, smiling at her. Hi, Stan, she replied, trying to keep her voice steady. They stood there for a moment, just looking at each other. Marcia felt a million emotions rushing through her, happiness, excitement, fear, and uncertainty. She didn't know what to say. Finally, Stan broke the silence. I heard about the draft, he said, his expression serious. I don't know what I'm going to do yet. Marcia felt a pang of sadness. She didn't want Stan to go to war, but she didn't want to be the reason he stayed either. She didn't know what to say, so she just nodded silently. They stood there for a few more minutes, neither of them saying anything. Marcia could feel the tension building between them. She knew she had to say something, but she didn't know what. Finally, she blurted out, I don't want you to go, Stan. I don't want to lose you. Stan looked at her, his expression softening. I don't want to go either, Marcia, he said but I don't know what else to do. They stood there for a few more moments, lost in thought. Marcia didn't know what the future held, but she knew one thing for sure. She didn't want to lose Stan. She just hoped he felt the same way. When he kissed Marcia, he left a big smudge on her cheek. That's a kiss worth harvesting, my girl, he chuckled. The best of the year. I agree, Dad, she replied. But I'll wait until you wash your face before I return the favor. How's the harvest going? We ran into some trouble today, he replied. What happened? Nothing major, but it was annoying. Some of our machines were damaged, and it took most of the day to fix them. We have a few hundred workers, some of whom are IWWs. They all deny it, and we have no way to prove otherwise. We couldn't catch them in the act. Nevertheless, we've managed to cut half of your big wheat field. A thousand acres, Marcia. Some of the wheat will yield forty bushels per acre, but most of it will be less. Still better than last harvest, Marcia said happily. We're lucky. Father, have you heard any news from Bend? I sure have, he replied, patting her head. They sent me a message from Vale. Young Arquette wired from Kilo that he'd be here today. 
Today, Marcia echoed, and her heart skipped a beat. Yes, he'll be here soon, Smith said cheerfully. Tell your mother. Maybe he'll come for supper and have a room ready for him. Yes, father, Marcia replied. Well, if Arquette sees you as you are now, with your sleeves rolled up, apron on, and flour on your nose, you'll look like a regular farmer girl and sure to win him over, Jake said, grinning. What are you talking about? Marcia exclaimed, blushing. She ran to her room and quickly changed her dress, but Arquette didn't show up in time for supper. Eight o'clock came and went without any sign of him, and with great disappointment, Marcia gave up expecting him that night. She was in her father's study, helping him with the harvest records and figures, when Jake knocked on the door. Arquette's here, he announced. Good. Go get him, Smith commanded. Father, I'd rather go, Marcia whispered. You stay right here with your dad, he replied, and be a real Smith. When Marcia heard Arquette's footsteps in the hallway, her heart fluttering ceased and she grew calm. She was glad to see him. It was the suspense of waiting that had played havoc with her feelings. Arquette entered with Jake and the cowboy set down a bag before leaving. He seemed strange to Marcia and very handsome in his gray flannel suit. As he stepped forward to greet her, Marcia saw how white he was and how tragic his eyes. There had come a subtle change in his face that hurt her. Miss Smith, I'm glad to see you, he said, and a flash of red stained his white cheeks. How are you? Very well, thank you, she replied, offering her hand. I'm glad to see you. They shook hands while Smith boomed out, Hello, son, I sure am glad to welcome you to many waters. There was no doubt as to the rancher's warm and hearty greeting. It warmed some of the coldness out of Arquette's face. Thank you. It's good to come, yet it's hard. Marcia saw his throat swell, and his voice seemed low and full of emotion. Bad news to tell, said Smith. Well, forget it. Have you had supper? Yes, at Huntington. I would have been here sooner, but we punctured a tire. My driver said the IWW was breaking bottles on the roads. IWW, now where have I heard that name before? asked Smith quizzically. Breaking bottles, hey? Well, they'll be busting their heads presently. Sit down, Arquette, you look fine, only you're sure pale. I lost my father, said Arquette. What, your old man, dead? Oh, that's tough. Marcia felt an almost uncontrollable impulse to go to Arquette. Oh, I'm sorry, she said. That is a surprise, went on Smith rather huskily. My lord, but it's only around the corner for every man. Come on, spill the beans. Give us the whole story, including the bad news, urged Arquette. Smith didn't finish his sentence. Arquette's face twisted as he began to speak, his eyes dark and intense with sorrow. It's bad news indeed. The IWW targeted us, Mr. Smith. Remember when you suggested that I ask my neighbors to help us with the wheat harvest? Almost all of them came to help, but we found phosphorus spread all over the field. Then on a hot day, fires broke out all around us. My neighbors left their own burning fields to help put out the fires on our land. We fought the flames all night, surrounded by fire on all sides. My father was furious, enraged by Stone's betrayal. You remember the scheme in which my father was involved, right? He refused to believe that the IWW would burn his wheat. When the fires broke out, he worked like a madman. It killed him. I wasn't with him when he passed, but our foreman Jerry was. My father's last words were, tell my son I was wrong. Thank God he sent me that message. I think he was confessing the Germans' iniquity. Anyway, our neighbor Olson managed to get the harvest done. He really rushed it. It would have been great if you and Miss Smith could have seen all those huge combines working together on one field. We harvested over 38,000 bushels and got all the wheat safely to the elevators at the station. And that night the IWW burned the elevators. Smith's face turned red with anger. He seemed about to explode, his throat rumbling with restrained profanity that Marcia knew he was holding back because of her presence. Her emotions were a mix of sorrow for Arquette, pride in her father's anger, and an indescribable feeling of sweetness in the revelation she was about to make to the unfortunate boy. However, she couldn't find the words to express herself at that moment, and it seemed her father was in the same state. Arquette appeared relieved after sharing his story. The tension in his face relaxed and his stern expression softened. He stood up, opened his bag, and took out some papers. Mr. Smith, I want to settle this right now, he said. I need to get it off my chest. Go ahead, son, and settle it, replied Smith, his speech slurred. 
He sighed heavily before sitting down and fumbling for a match to light his cigar. After taking a deep breath, he exhaled a cloud of smoke that seemed to console him. I want to give you all the property, including the land, to settle the mortgage and interest, Arquette said earnestly before pausing. All right, I expected that, Smith responded as he emitted another puff of smoke. The only thing is, Arquette hesitated, struggling to find the right words. The property is worth more than the debt. Sure, I know, said Smith encouragingly. I promised our neighbors a lot of money to harvest our wheat. You told me to offer it, remember? Well, they left their own wheat and barley fields to burn, and they saved ours. Then they harvested it and hauled it to the railroad. I owe Andrew Olson fifteen thousand dollars for himself and the men who worked with him. If I could pay that, I'd almost be happy. Do you think my property is worth that much more than the debt? I think it's just about, replied Smith. We'll mail the money to Olson. Marcia's hand shook as she wrote out the check for fifteen thousand dollars to Andrew Olson. She had never written such a poorly constructed check before. Her heart swelled with love for her father, who seemed so calm and collected. When she looked up from her task, she noticed a change in Stan Arquette's demeanor that made her eyes water. We'll run into town in a day or so and file the papers, said Smith as he took the check from Marcia. Arquette tried to express his gratitude, but Smith interrupted him, saying, Things ain't so bad as they look. For instance, we're going to fool the IWW down here in the valley. How can you? There are so many, replied Arquette. You'll see. We're just waiting for a chance, said Smith confidently. I saw hundreds of IWW men between here and Kilo, said Arquette. Can you tell an IWW from any other farmhand? asked Smith. Yes, I can, replied Arquette grimly. Well, I reckon we need you around here powerful much, said Smith dryly. Arquette, I've got a big proposition to put up to you. Marcia's heart raced as her father spoke. Arquette appeared more composed. Have you? he inquired. Sure, but there's no hurry about telling you. Suppose we put it off, said Smith. I'd rather hear it now. My stay here must be short. You know, began Arquette. Hmm, sure I know. Well, then it's this. Will you go in business with me? I want you to work that bend wheat farm of yours for me on half shares. More particularly, I want you to take charge of many waters. You see, I'm not as spry as I used to be. It's a big job, and I have a lot of confidence in you. You'll be living here, of course, and running around with one of my cars. I have some land development plans, and to cut it short, there's a big opportunity waiting for you in the Northwest, said Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, cried Arquette in a state of amazed joy, his face flushed with excitement. That's amazing. It's too good to be true. You're incredible. If I'm lucky enough to come back from the war— Son, you're not going to war, interjected Smith. Arquette stared at him blankly as if he had not heard him correctly. Smith calmly repeated his statement. He was smiling and looked kind, but his strong will was evident underneath. But I am, retorted the young man as if he had been misunderstood. Listen, you're like all boys, hot-headed and hasty. Let me talk a little, resumed Smith. He began to speak of the future of the Northwest, painting a picture that seemed like a fairy tale. Then he spoke of the government's needs and the needs of the armies and finally the needs of the people of the nation. Everything depended on the farmer. Wheat was indeed the staff of life and of victory. Young Arquette was one of the farmers who could not be spared. Patriotism was a noble thing. Fighting, however, did not alone constitute a duty and loyalty to the nation. This was an economic war, a war of peoples, and the nation that was the best fed would last longest. Adventure and the mistaken romance of war called indeed to all red-blooded young Americans. It was good that they did call, but they should not call the young farmer from his wheat fields. But I've been drafted, Arquette spoke with agitation. He seemed bewildered by Smith's blunt eloquence. His intelligence evidently accepted the elder man's argument, but something instinctive revolted. There's exemption, my boy. It's easy in your case, replied Smith. Exemption! exclaimed Arquette, his face flushing with anger. I wouldn't even consider it. You don't have to, replied the rancher. Arquette, do you remember that government official who visited you a while back? Yeah, Arquette responded slowly. Did he mention exemption? No, he asked if you wanted it, that's all, the rancher explained. Well, you had no right to do it without my permission, Arquette gasped, rising to his feet. 
The rancher, Smith, looked at Arquette with a mixture of sadness and understanding. I did it for your own good, son, he said. I recommended you for exemption because I know you're needed here at home. My own son went to war and that was enough for me. Arquette was still furious. How could you do that without asking me first, he demanded. I had no right, Smith admitted. But the official approved it and I thought it was the best thing for you. Arquette shook his head. I refuse to accept it, he said firmly. Smith looked at him incredulously. Why on earth not, he asked. Because I'm going to war, Arquette replied grimly. Smith tried to reason with him. But you're needed here, he said. You could do more for your country by staying and raising wheat. Arquette nodded slowly. I know, he said. But I have a duty to myself as well. I have to go fight for what I believe in. Smith sighed heavily. Well, I can't stop you, he said. But just remember, your fortune is right here at home. Don't turn your back on it. Arquette nodded again, his mind made up. I won't forget, he said, but I have to go. You want to fight? Smith asked Arquette. Yes, he replied. Smith threw his hands up in surrender. You want to kill some Germans, then? Why not come out to my fields and take care of some German IWWs? Arquette didn't know how to respond to that. I'm sorry, Smith said. I can see this is a tough situation for you. You can stay at my home for a few days. We all owe you a lot. My family wants to make it up to you. Will you stay? Arquette agreed to stay for a few days. Smith hoped that after spending time with his family and the girls, Arquette would start to think more reasonably. You think I'm ungrateful, Arquette said. I don't think anything, Smith replied. I'm turning you over to Marcia. He laughed as he watched Arquette's defeat and looked at Marcia, indicating that the outcome depended on her. Marcia, take him in to meet Mother and the girls and entertain him. I've got work to do. As Marcia led Arquette into the house, he seemed lost in thought. Miss Smith, I'd rather not meet your mother and sisters tonight, he said. I'm upset. Can we wait until tomorrow? Surely, Marcia replied, but I think they've gone to bed. She turned on the lights in the parlor and they sat down. The feeling of being alone with him was inexplicable, yet she felt completely free from the torment that had possessed her before. Marcia had divined an insurmountable obstacle in Arquette's will, making her tremble with the realization that her father's wishes and her future depended entirely on what she said and did. It was clear to her that she had become a woman. She knew that it would take a woman's wit, charm, and love to change this tragic boy. Miss Smith, he began brokenly with restraint let down. Your father doesn't understand. I've got to go. Even if I am spared, I couldn't ever come back. To work for him all the time in love with you, I couldn't stand it. He's so good. I know I could care for him, too. Oh, I thought I was bitterly resigned, hard, inhuman. But all this makes it so much worse. He sat down heavily, and completely unnerved, he covered his face with his hands. Short, strangled sobs broke from him, and Marcia had to overcome a rush of tenderness. She could not decide whether dropping to her knees beside him and slipping her arms around his neck would be womanly or not. All she knew was that she must make no mistakes. A hot, sweet flush went over her when she thought that always as a last resort she could reveal her secret and use her power. What would he do when he discovered she loved him? Stan, I understand, she said softly and put a hand on his shoulder. She stood beside him, sadly troubled vaguely divining that her presence was helpful until he recovered his composure. As he raised his head and wiped tears from his eyes, he made no excuses for his weakness, nor did he show any shame. Miss Smith, he began. Call me Marcia, she said. I feel so stiff when you're formal. My friends call me Marcia. He asked, you mean you consider me your friend? She replied with a smile. Indeed I do. He said, I'm afraid I misunderstood your asking me to visit you. She replied, I thank you. I'm proud and glad that you call me your friend. It will be splendid to remember when I am over there. I wonder if we could talk about anything except trouble and war, Marcia said plaintively. If we can't, then let's look at the bright side, he asked with a sad smile. Is there a bright side? Marcia replied, every cloud, you know, for instance, when you go to war, he interrupted, not if, I am going. Marcia softly returned, oh, so you say? She felt deep within her the inception of a tremendous feminine antagonism. It stirred along her pulse. Have your own way, then, 
but I say if you go, think how fine it will be for me to get letters from you at the front and to write you. You'd like to hear from me? You would answer, he asked breathlessly. Assuredly, and I'll knit socks for you, she replied. You're very good, he said with strong feeling. Marcia again saw his eyes dim, how strangely sensitive he was. If he exaggerated such a little kindness as she had suggested, if he responded to it with such emotion, what would he do when the great and marvelous truth of her love was flung in his face? The very thought made Marcia weak. You'll go to training camp, Marcia continued, and because of your wonderful physique and intelligence, you will get a commission. Then you'll go to France. You'll be in the thick of the great battles. You'll give and take. You'll kill some of those Germans. You'll be wounded and you'll be promoted. Then the Allies will win. Uncle Sam's grand army will have saved the world. Exciting news! You're coming back home to take the place that Dad offered you, Marcia exclaimed with enthusiasm. Arquette's face lit up, reflecting the brightness of the moment. I never thought you could be like this, he said in amazement. Like what? Marcia asked. I'm not sure. You're just different from what I imagined, not cold or arrogant. You're getting to know me better, she replied. After you've been here for a while. Please don't make it difficult for me, he interrupted pleadingly. I can't stay. Don't you want to? she asked. Yes, and I'll stay for a few days, but no longer. It'll be hard enough to leave then. Maybe we'll make it so hard for you that you won't be able to leave, she said with both longing and determination. Why? I thought you'd respect my sense of duty, he replied. Your duty is here, not at the front. The government man said so. My father believes it. So do I. You have other things you consider a duty, she explained. I hate Germans, he exclaimed, his eyes darkening with anger. Who doesn't, she retorted, standing up as if pulled by a strong current. She knew that the inevitable climax of their meeting was approaching, but she prayed for a little more time. She fought her emotions, watching him tremble. Marcia, I should run away at night, he said. Instinctively, she grabbed his hands with swift, gentle force. Perhaps the moment had arrived. She wasn't afraid, but the suddenness of her situation left her speechless. You wouldn't. That would be unkind, not like you at all. To leave without giving me a chance, without saying goodbye. I won't do it, she said firmly. He responded with weariness, seemingly confused by her stance. You said you understood me, but I can't understand you. She let go of his hands and turned away. You'll understand soon enough, she promised. You pity me. You think I'll just be cannon fodder for the Germans. You want to be nice to me, to send me away with better thoughts? Is that what you think? He was impatient and almost angry. His tragic face, defeat and struggle to hold on to his manliness challenged Marcia's compassion, love and combative spirit. She almost betrayed herself but was held back by panic. I'll give you the surprise of your life soon, she replied, putting on a smile. He was so obtuse and blind. Perhaps the stress of his fate left him with no keenness. He responded to her smile as if she were a determined child. You smiths are full of surprises, but please don't do any more for me. The kinder you are to me, the more I love you. How dreadful it is to go to war, to violence, blood and death, to all that's brutalizing with my heart and mind full of love for a noble girl like you. If I love you any more, I won't be a man. To Marcia, he looked like every bit of a man, tall, lithe, and white-faced, with his fiery eyes, simplicity, and tragic refusal of all that was the best of life for most men. Marcia had a chance to seize her ideal, but she couldn't grasp it. Her blood pumped thick and hot through her veins. If only she could be sure of herself. Or was it that she still cared too much about herself? The moment had not yet arrived. In her turmoil, she felt a fleeting anger at Arquette's blindness, at his reverence for her that he dared not touch her hand. Did he think she was made of stone? Let's say good night, she said. You're exhausted, and I'm not myself. Tomorrow we'll be good friends. Father will take you to your room. Arquette squeezed the hand she offered, and bidding her good night, he followed her to the hall. Marcia knocked on the door of her father's study, then opened it. Good night, Dad, I'm going up, she said. Will you take care of Stan? Sure, come in, son replied her father. Marcia felt Arquette's strange, intense gaze on her as she passed him. Lightly, she ran up the stairs and turned at the top. The hall was bright, and Arquette stood full in the light, his face upturned. 
It still wore the softer expression of those last few moments. Marcia waved her hand and he smiled. The moment was natural, youth to youth. Marcia felt it. She marveled that he did not. A sweet devil of willful coquetry possessed her. Oh, did you say you wouldn't go? she softly called. I said only good night, he replied. If you don't go, then you'll never be General Arquette, will you? What a shame. I'll go, and then it will be Private Arquette missing. No relatives, he replied. That froze Marcia. Her heart quaked. She gazed down upon him with all her soul in her eyes. She knew it and did not care. But he could not see. Good night, Stan Arquette, she called and ran to her room. Marcia found her composure only when she was ready for bed, with the light out and in her usual seat at the window. Nighttime silence and starlight always gave her strength. She prayed to them and to the spirit she believed was beyond them. Then she whispered a fact that her intelligence told her was unchangeable. Stan Arquette could never be changed. However, her sympathy, love, and passion, all the emotions of a woman, refused to listen to her intelligence. She knew that nothing short of a great shock could divert Arquette from his tragic headlong rush towards what he believed was his inevitable fate. Marcia sensed a terrible, sinister earnestness in him, but she could not understand its meaning. It was such a driving passion that no man possessing it and free to the violence of war could ever escape death. Even if by superhuman effort and the guidance of providence he did escape death, he would have lost something as precious as life. If Arquette went to war, he would go as no ordinary soldier to obey, to fight, to do his duty, but for some strange, unfathomable obsession of his own, and therefore if he went at all he was lost. War, in its inexplicable horror, killed the souls of endless hordes of men. Therefore, if he went at all, she too was lost to the happiness that might have been hers. She would never love another man, never marry, and never have a child. So his soul and her happiness were in the balance weighed against a woman's power. Marcia felt hopeless, unsure of how to save Arquette's life and soul. However, a sweet sensation of love called to her, tempting her with its infallible potency. She knew what she had to do. She would do anything to make Arquette love her so much that he would abandon his desperate intent. Time was short and there was no room for gradual growth of affection. Marcia had to bewilder Arquette with the revelation of her love and then hold him with all its incalculable power. It was her father's wish and it would save Arquette. Marcia was determined to be all woman, all sweetness, all love, all passion, all that was feminine and terrible to keep Arquette from going to war. She knew that the government would rather he stayed to raise wheat than fight men. Marcia saw the sanity and the cardinal importance of that, just as her father did. If keeping Arquette there made him a slacker, Marcia swore she would die before lifting her lips to his. In the darkness and silence of the night, with the cool wind on her face, Marcia vowed to do everything in her power to save Arquette. Chapter 19 Marcia woke up early to a beautiful morning filled with the sweet sound of birds chirping outside her window. She couldn't help but wonder what the day had in store for her. She placed a hand on her chest, trying to calm her racing heart, but the excitement was too much to contain. Despite waking up early, she found herself dragging her feet as she made her way downstairs. She found herself trying to prolong the inevitable, taking on small tasks to delay the daunting task that lay ahead. The atmosphere in the sitting room was lively, and Arquette's infectious laughter brought joy to all. The girls were all vying for his attention, and even her father's deep voice chimed in. It seemed there was a dispute over who would be able to spend time with their guest. They had already had breakfast, and Mrs. Smith expressed surprise at Marcia's late arrival, saying she had called her twice. However, Marcia had been lost in her thoughts, listening only to the birds and the melody in her head. She peeked into the sitting room and overheard Kathleen asking Arquette if he had brought her anything. Arquette, who was flushed and smiling, had no idea Marcia even had a little sister. Smith stood there beaming upon them, and Rose seemed to be showing signs of jealousy. Kathleen, on the other hand, was simply lovable and irresistible. Marcia feared that if Kathleen liked Arquette, she would take possession of him. She felt embarrassed and darted back before she could be seen. The thought of Kathleen's potential aid to her cause crossed Marcia's mind as she ate her breakfast and listened to the animated conversation in the sitting room. Her father eventually came in, greeting her cheerily, and Marcia shared that the day seemed like a challenge. 
Her father advised her that the biggest duty in life was to hide one's troubles. He also mentioned that Arquette looked like a human being that morning and the kids had won him over. He suggested letting them have him for a while before eventually taking him out to the wheat field. Marcia was curious about the other ranchers and asked if they were having any trouble. Rumors of bad work were circulating, but ranchers and recent visitors dismissed them. Golden Valley had yet to experience the burning of wheat and timber, destruction of machines, and striking of farm hands that had plagued other areas. The need for militia was unlikely. However, Marcia warned her father not to be overconfident. He was a target for IWW sabotage and needed to be careful. Her father reassured her that he had surrounded himself with cowboys and old hands who were armed and ready for any trouble. They were waiting for the IWW to make a move. Marcia pointed out that chasing the IWW away would only cause trouble for other farmers in neighboring states. Her father soberly acknowledged her point and left the room. Kathleen then entered, excitedly telling Marcia about her new bow. Marcia gave Kathleen advice on how to make him like many waters and promised to do everything for her if she followed her advice. Kathleen eagerly agreed, sensing a new and exciting way to conduct herself. Marcia was taken aback by Kathleen's enthusiasm. It's a bargain, Kathleen said, as if she had agreed to something weighty. Now, Kathleen, take him all over the gardens, the orchards, the corrals and barns, Marcia instructed. Be sure to show him my horses, especially. Take him round the reservoir and everywhere except the wheat fields. I want to take him there myself. Besides, Dad doesn't want you girls to go out to the harvest. Kathleen nodded and scampered back to the sitting room. Marcia heard them all leave together. Before finishing breakfast, Marcia's mother returned. Marcia, I like Mr. Arquette, she said thoughtfully. He has an old-fashioned manner that reminds me of my boyfriends when I was a girl. I mean, he's more courteous and dignified than boys nowadays. A handsome boy, too. Only his face is so sad. When he smiles, he seems like someone else. No wonder he's sad, replied Marcia, briefly telling her mother Stan Arquette's story. Ah, sighed Mrs. Smith. We have fallen upon evil days, poor boy. Your father seems very interested in him. And you are, too, my daughter? Yes, I am, replied Marcia softly. Two hours later, she heard Kathleen's joyful laughter and footsteps. Marcia put on her wide-brimmed hat and went out to the porch. Stan Arquette was not the same somber young man he had been before. "'Good morning, Stan,' said Marcia, shaking his hand. The moment he greeted her, she saw that the stiffness and aloofness had vanished. Kathleen had made him feel at ease. He looked younger. There was color in his face. "'Kathleen, I'll take care of Mr. Arquette now, if you'll allow me that pleasure. Lenore, I sure hate to give him up. We sure had a fine time.' Did he like many waters? Marcia asked. Well, if he didn't, he's a big liar, replied Kathleen. But he did. You can't fool me. I never thought I'd be able to get him back to the house, Marcia said as she climbed up the porch steps. She wagged her finger at Arquette. Remember! I'll never forget, Arquette replied earnestly. As Marcia disappeared inside, he turned to her friend, Marcia. What an adorable little girl! Do you like Kathleen? Marcia asked. Like her? Arquette laughed. My life has been empty, I see that now. Come on, let's go out to the wheat fields, Marcia suggested. What do you think of many waters? This is harvest time. You'll see it at its best. I can hardly describe it, Arquette replied. I've lived my whole life on barren hills. It feels like I've come to another world. Many waters is a ranch unlike any I've ever seen. The orchards, the fruit, the gardens, and the running water everywhere. It all smells so fresh and sweet, and the green, red, and purple against the blazing gold background. Many waters is verdant and fruitful. The bend is a desert. Now that you've been here, do you like it more than your barren hills? Marcia asked. I don't know, Arquette replied slowly. But maybe the desert I've lived in accounts for much of what I lack. If you weren't going to war, would you like to stay at many waters? Marcia asked. I might prefer many waters to any place on earth. It's a paradise. But I wouldn't choose to stay here. Why not? When you return, my father will need you here. And if anything should happen to him, I would have to run the ranch. Then I would need you. Arquette stopped in his tracks and looked at her with slight misgivings. Marcia, if you owned this ranch, would you want me as your manager? Yes, she replied, knowing that I was in love with you. 
Well, I had forgotten about that, she laughed. It'd be pretty funny, wouldn't it? She teased. He responded grimly, Yes, it would, and continued walking. He felt embarrassed and disappointed. I knew you weren't taking me seriously, he admitted. I believed you, but I couldn't take you too seriously, she murmured. Why not, he demanded, his eyes flashing. Because you didn't ask me the question that usually comes with a declaration like that, she explained. Good God, are you serious, he exclaimed. Marcia Smith, you think I'm insincere because I didn't ask you to marry me? He was hurt and frustrated. No, I just think you weren't very serious, she replied, enjoying the power she had over him but feeling guilty at the same time. She wanted to see how much he loved her, to make him show her. I'm going to war, he declared passionately. I'm fighting for you and your sisters. I'm ruined, and the only thing I have left is my love for you. If you don't believe that, then I'm the most miserable person in the world. Most guys going to war leave behind someone they love, but I have no one but you. Please don't make me a coward. I believe you. Please forgive me, she said, feeling remorseful for her teasing. If you had asked me to marry you, I would have thought you were selfish and egotistical. You're above me, and I know it. Even if I wasn't born with the blood I have, even if I was wealthy instead of broke, I wouldn't dare ask you to be mine until I come back from the war unscathed, said the man as they walked down the lane. They came close to the wheat field, and the dry wind carried the smell of the harvest, making the hot day pleasant. The sound of the machines was deafening, like the roar of a flour mill. If you come back from the war unharmed? Marcia asked teasingly. She was determined to have her fun with him. He was so blind it was unbelievable, but that made her happy. He was like the barren hills of his desert, simple but strong and heroic. Then I'll propose to you just to add another conquest to the list of things girls love, he joked. Watch out, boy, I might just accept, she laughed. But his playful mood didn't last. Even under her influence, he couldn't be carefree. Please stop joking, he said, frowning. Can't we talk about something else besides love and war? Those topics seem to be popular right now, she replied boldly. And besides, all's fair in love and war, you know. No, it's not fair, he said, his voice low and serious. So please, I beg of you, stop joking. I know you're sweet and you have so many wonderful surprising words and looks, but I can't understand you. Please don't make me look foolish. Well, if you keep complimenting me and if I like them, what then? she asked, amused. You're very original and gallant, Mr. Stan Arquette, and I quite like you. I'll get angry with you, he threatened. You couldn't. I'm the only girl you're leaving behind, and if you got angry, I'd never write to you, she said, thrilled and heartbroken to see how her words affected him. He was in agony. He thought she was teasing him, speaking lightly with a girlish tone to show that she was just a carefree girl who enjoyed the thrill of winning over even him. I give up. Say what you want, he said, giving in. I'll do anything to get your letters. If you leave, I'll write to you as often as you want, she replied. With that, they stepped out into the harvest field. The golden slope was dotted with machines and engines, and tall straw stacks stood wherever they were located. Horses, men, and wagons stretched as far as the eye could see, with long streams of chaff, dust, and smoke rising up. Marcia, there's trouble in the air, said Arquette. Look! She saw a crowd of men gathering around one of the large combine harvesters with someone yelling. Let's stay away from trouble, Marcia replied. We have enough of our own. I'm going over there, declared Arquette. Maybe you should wait for me or go back. Well, you're the first boy who ever— Marcia began. Come on, he interrupted with a grim sense of humor. You'll enjoy seeing me break loose if there's any IWW trickery. Before they reached the small crowd, Marcia saw and heard her father in a rage, unaware of her presence. Jake and Bill, the cowboys, were hovering over him, while Smith walked back and forth from one side of the harvester to the other. Marcia didn't recognize any of the harvest hands, and even the driver was new to her. They weren't a typical western harvest crew, that much was clear. She didn't like their sullen looks, and Arquette's muttered curse as he neared them confirmed her opinion. Smith's foreman stood gesticulating, pale and anxious. No, I don't blame you, shouted the rancher. But I need action. I need to know why this machine broke down. It was working perfectly, declared the foreman. I don't know why it broke down. That's the fourth machine in two days. This ain't no accident, boys, Smith shouted, his voice ringing out over the fields. 
He spotted Arquette and beckoned him over. Arquette, get over here, he called, stepping away from the group of dusty men. Something ain't right with this new McCormick harvester. It's been working great, but I reckon it's been tampered with. You know these machines? Arquette nodded. Yeah, they're reliable, he replied. Uh-huh. Well, take off your coat and see what's been done to this one, Smith ordered. Arquette complied, handing his coat to Marsha as he approached the broken-down harvester. As he began to work on the machine, Marsha whispered to her father, Dad, I don't like the look of these harvest hands, Smith shrugged. This is just a sample of the lot I hired. No fancy society for you, my girl. Arquette continued to work, the sounds of his wrench and the harvester's machinery filling the air. Finally he emerged, covered in grime and holding the wrench. His gaze was fixed on Smith. Smith, I knew right where to find it, he said in a hard voice. This monkey wrench was thrown onto the platform, carried to the elevator and into the thresher. Your machine is torn to pieces out of commission. Smith let out a relieved uh-huh as the truth sank in. Where'd that wrench come from? he asked the foreman. It ain't ours. I don't buy that kind, the foreman replied, shocked. Smith motioned to the cowboys, and they all knew what to do next. The men stood beside him, looking just as dangerous as he did. Hey, Stan, he called out, motioning for Marcia to stand in front of him. They moved a few steps away from the harvest hands, out of earshot. You were right on the money, weren't you? Arquette replied. I've had a hell of a time this harvest season, but I'll bet you I can figure out who threw that wrench into your harvester. I don't doubt you, kid. But how? It had to be one of these guys near the machine. The harvester hasn't gone more than twenty feet from where the trick was played. Let them face me and I'll find the guilty one. Let's wait until we get Marsha out of the way first, Smith replied. I can vouch for the outfit as it is, boss. No risks for nobody, Jake chimed in. Before Smith could reply, there was a loud explosion. Marsha was frightened, thinking one of the steam engines had blown up. That thresher's on fire, Arquette shouted, pointing to a big machine attached to an engine by an endless driving belt. The workman ran towards the scene of the new accident, leaving Smith, his daughter, and the foreman behind. Smoke was pouring out of the big harvester. The harvest hands ran around wildly, shouting and calling, unable to do anything. The line of wagons filled with wheat sheaves broke up, with men dragging the plunging horses. Then flames followed the smoke out of the thresher. I've heard of threshers catching fire, Smith said, looking dumbfounded. But I've never seen one. How did this happen? Another trick, Smith, Arquette replied. Some IWW has stuffed a handful of matches into a wheat sheaf, or maybe a small bomb. Uh-huh. Let's go see my money burn up, Smith said, resigned. Stan, I'm getting some new education these days. Arquette couldn't contain his excitement and hurried ahead of the others. As they stood watching the field, Smith leaned in to whisper to Marcia, I have a feeling something's about to go down. Marcia was both alarmed and excited by the statement. Suddenly the threshing machine burst into flames and farmhands rushed over from all directions to try and save it. Despite their efforts, it was clear that the thresher was beyond repair. Smith, holding his daughter's arm, calmly watched it burn. There was an air of excitement all around, but the rancher seemed deep in thought. The foreman was clearly distressed as he darted among the groups of onlookers. Arquette had disappeared from sight, and Marcia still clung to his coat, wondering what he was up to. She was thoroughly angry and couldn't believe her father's composure. The once large thresher was now reduced to a smoking hulk in no time. Arquette returned, his face pale and his mouth set. Mr. Smith, you need to take a strong stand and quickly, he said deliberately. I'm ready if it's the right time, replied the rancher. But what can we prove? That's proof, declared Arquette, pointing at the ruined thresher. Do you know all your honest hands? Yes, and I have enough to clean up this outfit in no time. We're just waiting. Waiting for what? Well, I reckon we're waiting for what just happened. Don't let them go any further. Look at these fellows. Can't you tell the IWWs from the others? No, I can't unless I count all the new harvest hands IWWs. Everyone you don't know here is in with that gang, declared Arquette, waving his hand at the groups. His eyes swept piercingly over and apparently through the men nearest at hand. At that moment, Jake and Bill, along with two other cowboys, strode up to Smith. Another accident, boss, said Jake sarcastically. 
Isn't it about time we corralled some of this outfit? Smith did not reply. He had suddenly become fixated on Arquette's look. That was certainly cause for concern. A man in rugged clothes, his slouch hat pulled low over his eyes, caught Arquette's attention. Marsha watched as he quickly turned and walked away upon realizing he was being scrutinized. Hey, hold on, called Arquette, his voice commanding attention from everyone around them. Arquette bounded across the field, beckoning his comrades to follow. Let's go, boys. Arquette spotted someone, and that's all we need. Marsha, stay close behind me. Jake, stick with her. They hurried over to back up Arquette, who had already caught up to the workman he had stopped. Smith pulled out a whistle and blew it so hard that it hurt Marsha's ears, and must have been heard all over the field. It was probably a signal that Smith and his men had agreed upon. Marsha realized that they had been prepared for a coordinated move, and that her father believed Arquette's action had brought the situation to a head. "'Have I seen you before?' Arquette asked the man sharply. The man shook his head, keeping it slightly bowed, and began to back away towards the stragglers, who slowly gathered into a group behind him. He appeared nervous and uneasy. "'He can't speak English,' one of them spoke up gruffly. Arquette looked stern and aggressive. Suddenly he snatched the slouch hat off the man's head. To Marsha's surprise, a gray wig came off with it. The man was not old and had thick, fair hair. Arquette stared at the wig and hat for a moment before making a fierce grab for the man. The man dodged and reached for a gun, but Arquette lunged at him. They grappled fiercely with a hard, scraping sound and a hoarse yell. Something bright flashed in the sunlight, making a sweeping circle and belching fire and smoke. The sound of the shot stunned Marsha. She squeezed her eyes shut and clung to her father as she heard the sounds of a brawl. "'Jake, Bill!' called out Smith. "'Hold on! No gunplay yet. Arquette's making hash out of that fellow. But watch the others sharp!' Marcia opened her eyes again and saw Arquette pulling off the man's disguise, revealing a young man's face. "'Stone!' exclaimed Arquette in fury. He gathered himself and launched at Stone, knocking him down and disarming him. Three of Stone's companions made a move for his gun, but Cowboy Bill stepped in with his own guns drawn. Here I'm back, he shouted as everyone else froze. Marsha's heart raced as she watched Arquette pummel Stone, throwing him around like a rag doll. She could barely follow the movements, but her father warned her to stay back as Jake held his gun ready. Boss, he's going to kill Stone, whispered the cowboy. Smith's reply was garbled, but Marsha begged, don't let him. The crowd around them shifted and men moved closer, but Bill strode across the space with his guns aimed at anyone who tried to interfere with Arquette's fight. "'Well, it's about time!' shouted Smith as a group of lean, rugged men rushed up from behind and stood by Bill's side, brandishing their weapons and looking menacing. All eyes now focused on Arquette and Stone. Marcia, seeing everything clearly for the first time, was overcome with a strange, hot burst of emotion that she had never felt before. It left her feeling weak and unable to scream out that Arquette should not kill the man. Despite her desire to stop Arquette, there was a ferocity in her that froze her in place. Stone's coat and blouse were half torn off, and his body was covered in blood. He struggled and flung himself weakly in that iron grip, beaten and bent back. His tongue hung out, bloody and fluttering with strangled cries. His face was a ghastly sight, filled with fear of death. Finally, Marcia broke her silence, overcome with horror and passion. For God's sake, don't let Arquette kill him, she pleaded. Why not, muttered Smith. That's Stone. He killed Arquette's father, burned his wheat, and ruined him. Dad, for my sake, she cried, her voice breaking. Jake, stop him. Pull him off, yelled Smith. Arquette, let go. You're cheating the gallows. Hey, Bill, he's a bull. Help. We need help here, quick. Marcia couldn't see what happened next, but she could sense from the way the crowd swayed that Stone had been freed. "'Hold up this outfit!' yelled Smith to his men. "'Come on, Jake, drag him along!' Jake appeared, leading the disheveled and wild-eyed Arquette. "'Son, you did my heart good, but there were some around here who didn't want you to spill blood. 